Hi and welcome to Parashat Beit Hanan, another action-packed parasha. We have Moshe's plea to enter Israel, we have the Ten Commandments, we have the Shema, we have the commandment not to indulge in prosperity and uh, to trust in Hashem and to give over to your children the traditions of, the, of our heritage. But uh, I want to just say that this was also an action-packed week. We had at the beginning of the week, uh, the Ari's Yacht Site, we invited seven incredible educators to come and tell us something about the Ari. Um, I particularly enjoyed and I recommend you to hear, if you haven't already done so, the uh, lectures by uh, Josef Stepanski, the archaeologist and historian here in Sfat, and also Ramosh Schatz, who came from, from uh, uh, Jerusalem to address us. Uh, I call him the father of uh, the teachers of the Kabbalah. And uh, also the highlight was uh, Yoel Turjuman's uh, ad uh, address uh, in his tribute when we walked down to the Kever itself. Uh, a most emotional um, a clip where you saw firsthand the dedication of all the people praying there in the heat of 39 degrees. It was quite, uh, quite an oven there. And um, they all came out in their flocks to pay tribute to the Ari, and I would recommend you to look at that video as well. It's all available on our channel. Then we had my birthday, and then we had another uh, treat of Tuesday's learning, and then we had Tisha B'Av. So all in all, a very filled week, which is why this particular podcast is late in coming out to you. But I, I hear from firsthand that many of you like to listen to it during the time that you're making um, your cooking for Shabbat. I really hope this will arrive at your doorsteps in time for that. So let's go straight into this uh, beautiful plea that Moshe has to God for asking him to enter into the land. And there are many very strange anomalies. Firstly, you can see in verse 2 where Moshe is addressing Hashem. He addresses him in the form and the formula Adonot Yud Kebab K, my Lord Elohim. And we'll come to a minute why we why he does. The other thing to notice is the very strange phraseology in, in verse 25, where, where he asks the Evrana, let me cross, please. It should have been the other way around. He said, please let me cross. In other words, not Evra. Uh, why is that switched? The other thing that the that the Ashach brings out in verse 26, Lemanchem. Uh, in other words, God didn't allow me to enter because of you. But we know that God didn't allow Moshe to enter because he hit the rock instead of speaking to the rock. So why is this sudden blaming on the Bene Israel for Moshe not being able to go in? And then finally, in chapter 4, verse 1, we see Ve'ata, mean Ve'ata Shema Israel in the singular. And yet when it says, uh, in plural, in plural, in plural, in plural. That's five plural verbs uh, after the singular uh, command Shema Israel. What's that coming to tell us? So basically, this verb, Vayit Hanan, it has a gematria of 515, and the sages say that, God, that Moshe prayed to God 515 times, praying for him to come into the land. That's how much he desperately wanted it. So the Asha asks, why is all of a sudden now he's praying for it? Um, and it's, uh, apparently it's a response to the Jewish people who said, Moshe, why didn't you use this pre, uh, precise opportunity to pray to God. I mean, after all, we are clearly in his favor. We just beat beat uh, Og and Sichon and were about to enter the land. He is clearly, Hashem loves us, and this is the best time to pray. Uh, and so why didn't you do it? And so Moshe answers, yes, I did. I used this best opportunity time to pray. But Hashem didn't listen to my prayer. And uh, I've always looked at this as well. Wow, Several interesting things. Firstly, uh, are the sages suggesting that if Moshe prayed 516 times, Hashem would have allowed him to come in? I mean, where's Hashem's free will in that? And also, it suggests that Hashem has to answer all our prayers. And no is also an answer. And in verse 26, it says, Hashem became angry with me because of you. 
what is that about? And he did not listen to me. Hashem said to me, this is too much for you. Don't speak to me about this matter. I mean, I thought that Hashem loves our prayers and wants us to pray, wants us to connect with him. So why is he kind of shunning off Moshe at this time? On the surface level, it seems a little bit harsh to say that Moshe will definitely not enter the land of Israel. And the Asher uh, solves this problem with a completely different approach. And, and I think it sits much more comfortably with me. When God says Ravlach in verse 27, he's saying that you don't need to pray anymore, Moshe, because you have all the merits to enter the land as it is. The reason you're not entering the land is not because you don't have the merit, but because it's not in the best interest of the people of Israel that you enter. The idea is that if Moshe was to enter, then any deviation from God's laws would have been treated much more harshly with Moshe in their midst. And therefore, Hashem is saying to Moshe, don't enter because of the Jewish people, because for their sakes, so that there is more leniency if they go off the, off the path. But the Asher is suggesting that the plea of Moshe went like this, that God, the whole of Exodus and receiving the Torah in the desert is all a preamble for what? For us entering the land of Israel. And so if I can't enter in the capacity of a leader of Ben Israel, let, let me at least enter as a personal private individual. And we have straight after this plea, the, again, the repetition that Joshua is going to take over as leader, from Moshe. And so this phraseology, ve'evaran na, the na is placed at the end of the verb, almost like fiddler on the roof. Would it change your overall plan if you made me a rich man? Like Moshe is saying, would it make any difference to your overall plan if I enter Israel just as an individual person? Surely that request would be insignificant compared to all the miracles that you've made for me personally and the Jewish people so far. And the answer from Hashem is that no, you cannot enter for the sake of the Jewish people. You cannot enter. And you'll see that in verse 26, the word alai for me is mentioned three times. And the Asha suggests that this is a further confirmation that it's not due to the lack of the merit of Moshe that this request was denied. And a beautiful interpretation of the words Ravlach, it's too much for you, uh, from the al Sheikh is that you don't need to pray for this anymore because I'm going to command you now to go to the top of the cliff and look at the land north, south, east, west. And I assure you that whatever you would have achieved by physically going into the land, you will achieve by looking at it. Hashem assures him that whatever you see with your physical eyes is if you actually personally entered the land. And the phrase kilota avor is reinforcing the idea that you don't need to cross in order to experience the sensation that you would have experienced by physically walking around uh, in the land. And this brings us to a beautiful idea that I wanted to explore with you. And that is that everything in creation, everything in our physical world is basically a physical manifestation of a certain vibration or energy that's brought down from the spiritual world. And so you might pray for uh, abundance in the, and you want to see that abundance in the form of a, a red Ferrari car. But Hashem will, might answer you that I want to give you the abundance, but this is what it's going to look like. It might look like something completely different. And so the lesson for us is, yes, it's important to pray and to visualize to Hashem what we want. And be very clear what we're paying, praying for, but not to invest in a particular outcome of that prayer. And to be open to receive it in whatever way God wants to give it to us, because His way is the perfect way. Ours is always warped by the influence of the ego. So when Moshe is invited to see the land, it's as if he was receiving the vibrations of having entered the land at a higher spiritual level. But the bottom line is that the effect on him is the same. At least that's how I would like to interpret it. And this reminds me of a beautiful story that you are Turjman used to tell us. And that is that when he, found, when he felt the urge to travel, he would simply go to the airport have a look at the arrivals and look at all the destinations that the planes have come from. 
and he would feel like he was actually visiting those places themselves. This idea that the visualizing something physically or in your imagination can give you the same experiences if you actually received it. And if you want to get an example of that, imagine that you won the lottery ticket. At what stage do you express that supreme joy of having won it? Do you wait till the money physically comes into your bank account? Or do you express it the minute you see the numbers in the TV showing you that you have won? Of course, the minute you realize that you won, you're ecstatic, even though the money hasn't yet arrived. And I think this is the lesson for us. We've just gone through Tisha B'Av, and we have to visualize the reality of us in the period of Mashiach with the third temple, as if it's already here. And that's what I love about living in Tzfat, because here, somehow, we're so removed from what's happening further down in the Mirkaz, in the center, with all the civil unrest, we're so removed from that, and we're in, a, in our own bubble where we live our lives as, as if the Mashiach is already here. And it makes for a much better quality of life, I can tell you. So now let's turn to chapter 4, and you can see Ve'ata and now. What is the significance of now? This is actually Moshe saying to the Jewish people, Listen, this is the last time I can address you. So now please listen to me. I'm giving you over something very important. And what is that message? And now listen, O Israel, to the decrees and to the ordinances that I will teach you to perform so that you may live and you may come to possess the land that Hashem, our God, your Father has given you. And you remember that Shema Israel is, is in the singular and all the verbs are in the plural. And there's a beautiful teaching here. And that is that when it comes to listening to God, we are all as one, all equal in our ability to listen to God. But when it comes to performance, each one of us will perform the instructions in our own particular way, which will vary in quality and quantity. And that is why those verbs are putting the plural. As it says, there are 70 versions of the Torah. There are 70 ways in which you can serve Hashem. And also that there are eight candles on the menorah, and each one is equally valid. And there are some very, very beautiful lessons about how to pray to God in this early part of the parasha. And that is the following three points. The first is to address God in the following way, Adonai first, and then Yud Kei Vav Kei. In other words, the God who is all-powerful in creation, and also Yud Kei Vav Kei, the transcendental God who transcends all of matter, including creation. And notice also that in verse 24, we also have the reference to Gvora, Gvora uh, This idea of mighty deeds is the second. And so all prayers should be addressed in that way. In other words, before you ask for your particular request, first acknowledge who you're addressing in terms of God. We know that in the Shemona Esri, the Amida prayers, it's the first three prayers are always the same. And it's based on, these, on this parish of Eid Hanan. The second prayer of the Amidah is Gvurot, and we have that in, at the end of verse 24, Gvurot Echa. And the third part of the Amidah is Atakadosh, and that is represented by the words in the parasha of Mi El Bashamayim Varetz. And so we have here the, this classic formula of how to pray to God. And now we come to chapter 3, verse 29, where it says, And so you should remain in the valley opposite Bet Peor. What is that all about? And again, here we have a fascinating lesson about human psychology and life. And that is that we cannot rely on our intellect, on our mind, and our intelligence to guide us when it comes to serving Hashem. Because Moshe is reminding us that we erred in Be'er, in the valley of Be'er Peor, because we thought that particularly the elite of the Israelis felt that by denigrating the idol of Baal Peor, by defecating in front of them, that this would show that they are dismissing the idol. But in fact, they didn't realize that this very performance as ugly as it was, was the very way in which this deity was being worshipped. And that's what we have in verse 2. You should not add a word and you should not subtract the word from the, word, from the commandments that I've given you. It says in verse 3, Your eyes have seen what Hashem did to Baal Peor, and every man that followed Baal Peor 
Hashem your God destroyed him in his midst. But you who cling to Hashem your God, you are alive today. This famous phrase, V'atem hadbikim badunai Elohechem haim kohem hayom. And so the message is, don't be fooled by your intellect to think, I know how to serve Hashem my way in terms of interpreting the laws in your particular way. As we saw in Baal that many people perished in the plague of Baal regardless of their status, and only those that cleave to Hashem's commandments survive. And in verse 5 we see, See, I have taught you the decrees and the ordinances, as Hashem my God has commanded me to do in your midst of the land of which you are going to come and possess it. You should safeguard and perform them, for it is your wisdom and discernment in the eyes of the people who shall hear all these decrees and say, Surely a wise and discerning people is this great nation. Why are we so concerned about how the nations appear to, to see us? And the Elsha says that the attitude towards statues is something we have to look at, because statues are the laws that we cannot put logical explanation for it. We have to perform them because just simply because Hashem commanded us to do it. So. And instead of thinking that us performing these statues will make us the laughing stocks of the nation, in fact, the opposite happens. The nation will look at the, our merits as our, from our deeds and actions and attribute the success of the Jewish people, which is undeniable to the very laws that we are observing. Because after all, the Gentiles have social laws and the Jewish people have social laws. So what is the difference between the two? The difference is the statues which the Jewish people have that the Gentiles don't. And therefore the, Jewish, the non-Jews will look at the Jews and, and feel that their very success is due to the performing of those statutes. And again, a beautiful teaching here because uh, the Alshech is suggesting that there are elements of sanctity in Hashem's commandments. And by us p performing them, we actually become elevated to a place of being a righteous people simply by practicing these laws. And so the emphasis is not to, to detract or add anything to what is given down to us from the sages. And as we know in practical terms, if one letter of the Torah is missing, then the whole Torah is pasul, is invalid and cannot be used. And therefore, we have to adhere to the entire Torah and not take on piecemeal, this I'm going to do, this I'm not going to do, this I agree with, this, this I don't agree with. It doesn't work like that. Ah, so it's, not, so it's not possible for us to keep all the mitzvot in one time, but at least we can approach it with the mentality, Hashem, I accept that all the mitzvot are important. At the moment, this is what I can do. Help me to achieve the others. Rather than saying, I don't believe in those laws because they don't make sense to me. And as we come to the Ten Commandments, Moshe reminds us of how these heavenly powers manifested themselves in a way that we can perceive them. It is God himself who is performing this and not some angel, because an angel would never be able to give us the experience of, as we would describe, seeing the sounds. And this reference of seeing the sounds, an indication of the effectiveness of the revelation of Mount Sinai. We were granted a visual image of something that's normally only audible. And the Elsha suggests that it's, it was illogical for, for Hashem to reveal himself in this way to us. And it was only because the Jewish people asked Moshe for this. They had heard Hashem's voice, but they asked to see Hashem. And so Hashem accepted by giving them a visual representation of, his, of the sounds of his voice. And the Elsha, quoting the Midrash, asks, Is it reasonable to grant a child's every request? Uh, no matter how unreasonable the request may be, why did God accept this request from the Bene Israel to see him? And the Elsha suggests that what God did was to look in the future and see that the, the Jewish people will actually do the golden calf sin. And he wanted to deny them the excuse that they would say, oh, if only we had seen you, Hashem, we would never have done the golden calf. And that is, why the re and that is one of the reasons why he accepted their request to see him, and therefore we saw the sounds.
And here's another great lesson. In other words, sometimes when our prayers are answered, be careful because sometimes they might be answered so that we don't have an argument in the future to defend a certain action in the future that might be against God's will. And finally, I want to just address this point of in, ver in chapter 4, verse 14, where it says, the word al, on, it's, it should have been in. Uh, you should write them in, in the tablets, not on the tablets. And this al refers to the supernatural nature of the writings of the tablets. In other words, only when presented in this low, lower world did the writings take on a physical manifestation. In other words, assume a concrete material form in a form that we're familiar with. And even though they, may, they assumed this physical form, they remained in, uh, supernatural. And this idea is beautifully confirmed by the scientists, the astronauts that go into space. And remarkably, it is clear that the rays of the sun is not visible until the rays enter the stratosphere of the Earth. And this is very much an indication of how uh, the spiritual is transformed into the physical as it comes further down into the uh, lower worlds of the earth. And now we can understand more clearly why it's much easier to adjust and correct for things by going up into the spiritual spheres and adjusting them there before they descend into a more physical expression of them in this physical world. And that goes for both health issues, as well as parnasa, as well as relationships. Everything disseminates from heaven to the earth through the different sefirot. And so the greatest power we can yield as humans is to elevate ourselves through the spiritual ladder and attack and deal with these items at the spiritual level rather than trying to combat them head on head in the physical plane. And that's all we have time for. We've only covered about 10% of the Aushar's wisdom on this parasha, but uh, at least it's something for you. And may I leave you with this bracha, and that is that when you read the parasha, just take time to read it slowly and digest it, because this is basically an executive summary of the whole of the Torah. Every sentence is a gem of wisdom, a pearl of, of wisdom to internalize to our, into our being, into our lives. And therefore, take the time to read it, and not only read it, but try to understand the messages within it, because everything is so clear when we do that. And I promise you, so many conflicts, internal conflicts in your minds will disappear if you just apply this philosophy into your lives. And I am, for one, so pleased that we're over the uh, negative energy of Tisha B'Av, heading towards Tu B'Av, sublime love and chesed in the world, as we build up to Elul, where we start preparing the marathon run, leading us to the holy day of Rosh Hashanah, where all our future, when everything about our next year's life will be determined. So may we have the merit to use these learnings to help us to prepare to turn up in Rosh Hashanah in the best possible way, to manifest all our dreams. And remember to be open to receive them in the way Hashem perfectly wants to give it to us, as opposed to what we think we want to see it in. Shabbat Shalom. See you next week.